continuing our look at the book of Ruth. There's one term that I haven't spent the time to really unpack as we've been going through the book of Ruth, and that is the term redeemer. It was mentioned last week whenever, or mentioned a few weeks ago actually, Naomi mentioned that Boaz was a redeemer. Last week when, when Ruth essentially asked for Boaz's hand in marriage, said, for you are a redeemer. In this fourth chapter, we're going to see this word redeemer used over and over again. And it comes from the, the Hebrew word goel, which has to do with a family member, someone who's a next of kin, close relations, who is instructed by the law of God to be a redeemer, to be a rescuer, a deliverer. And if a family member is in need, then this redeemer ought to redeem them, ought to rescue them, help them, to set them free. And the word redeemer is how we translate it because often it is setting free from slavery because when someone was, was so impoverished in those days, well, they would, they would actually sell themselves into slavery. And it wasn't so much in ancient Israel, the slavery like we typically think of, but it's essentially you are, because you have no money yourself and no way to support yourself, you go and you work for somebody else and you are indebted to them. And in order to, to free yourself from that or to get yourself essentially back on your own feet, then someone in your family would, would stand in that place and be a redeemer to set you free from that bondage and to help you so that you can again be self-sufficient. And so this was the idea of the Redeemer. Redeemer is also used in Scripture to refer to a family member who would come and, and deal out vengeance for the death of another person in the family. It was someone who was to come and deliver, to rescue, to help a family member in need. The term Redeemer is used of God all over the place in the Old Testament. And that's where, as God gives his law to his people, that's where it's a reflection of. It's used of God when he delivers his people out of bondage in Egypt. And so the word redeemer describes a family member who is a savior, a rescuer, a deliverer, who rescues others just like God rescues his people. It is to be a reflection of who God is for his people. And like God is a good father who redeems his people, so too are you as God's child to be a redeemer, to restore and to deliver others in time of need. So this is the theme that is unpacked in this chapter, that of the redeemer. And it really asks the question, well, who is, who is going to be the redeemer? This far in the story of, of Ruth, we have Naomi and Ruth coming from Moab back to Bethlehem. This is Naomi's hometown where she is from. Ruth, a Moabite, coming to a foreign land. Naomi has lost her husband to death. Ruth has lost her husband. Naomi's two sons are dead. She comes back feeling that she has nothing and that God is actively against her. And she's full of bitterness toward God for her state. And as they come back to Bethlehem to try to make some kind of life for themselves, Ruth ends up working, gleaning in the fields of Boaz. And Boaz cares for Ruth and thereby cares for Naomi. And as the harvest season winds to a close, Naomi has a plan for Ruth and Boaz to get together. And last week we looked at her plan come to fruition, but there was one wrinkle of her plan. As, as Boaz seems set to take Ruth under his wing and into her household and to marry Ruth and thereby care for her and care for Naomi, there's a wrinkle. Boaz mentions that there's actually a, a closer redeemer. There's actually another family member who's a closer relation to Naomi's former husband, Elimelech. A closer relation that really ought to be the redeemer or at least have a say in the matter before the lot falls to Boaz. And so we enter the fourth chapter with Boaz saying, I'm going to take care of this matter the next day. And here we are in chapter four, it's the next day. And Boaz is going to handle this matter and we're going to find out who is the one who is going to redeem Ruth and Naomi. And 
Another question we might ask of this text is not only who is going to redeem them, but how is God, the great redeemer, going to orchestrate his salvation in their lives? So look with me in Ruth chapter four. Look at verse number one. It says, now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. Some explanation is required so we understand the context here in the ancient world. When Boaz gets up in the morning and goes to the gate and sits down there, he's going to court, essentially. The gate is the entrance and exit from the town or the village. Normally, if you were in a bigger city, you had walls around that city and you had gate. And and you would stay in the city at nighttime for safety. And then you would exit the gate in the morning. You go out to your fields, to your work, and then come back into the city for refuge at night. And not only was the gate the entryway, but because it was the entry and exit and everyone was traveling in and out of that gate, the gate would be built up with rooms and a courtyard and business would be handled there. So in those days, they didn't have city officials that were full-time bureaucrats or politicians. You had the elders, the men of the city, who would go to that gate for times of, of need, of crisis, to make a decision, and they would gather there, and that's where the decisions were made. If there was a matter of justice to be decided, there was someone who was, who was acting sinfully and wrongly, they were brought to the elders at the gate, and there would be a court And the elders would decide what to do with the case using the word of God as their guide. And so when Boaz goes and sits down at the gate, he's going to this place of decision. He's going where the elders go and he's sitting there and waiting for everyone to come out to grab them and say, hey, we have business to take care of today. Now Boaz must have got there early before all the men of the city would leave for their field work. And so he sits down at the gate and then suddenly he sees the Redeemer. You notice what the text says. Boaz sits down, he's ready for court. And then behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken comes by. The language here conveys almost like a bit of a surprise. Behold, suddenly he just happens to be there. But again, we know from the book of Ruth that this is the way for the the narrator to show us God's hand, unseen, but still working in those events. So Boaz needs to talk to this redeemer today. And suddenly he sits at the gate, he's ready to talk. And then behold, the redeemer is there. God has brought this encounter together and this is going to get done. Now I want you to notice how Boaz calls him. Boaz sees the Redeemer, and he says, turn aside, friend, sit down here. Now, the ESV translates friend, this word, you might have other ways of of translating this in your Bibles, but it's really a strange Hebrew construction. It's poloni almoni. And if you were to look up in, in in a Hebrew dictionary, poloni or almoni, you wouldn't get anything from those two words. That, that on their own, they don't really mean anything. And so some have thought this is so strange for, for Boaz to, to call this man. It's, it's not a name, but it's some kind of idiom or phrase. And, and the ESV translated here, friend, but it's not exactly captures what Boaz is doing here and what the narrator is recording for us here. This, this Hebrew idiom, poloni almoni, is something that has no meaning on its own, but together has a meaning. It's almost like the English words hodgepodge or heebie-jeebies or helter-skelter. And I know some of you here aren't native English speakers. And so I'll be asking, what's helter-skelter? Well, I'll just look up dictionary for helter and then I'll look up skelter and I'll find out what helter-skelter means. But you know, that won't work because that, that is not how you understand that idiom or that phrase. And so helter-skelter is like a, like a mixed up pile. It's not organized, but, but the words on their own have no real meaning. And the same here is true with this poloni almoni. Now it's used elsewhere in scripture, which helps us understand how it's used here. The first place it's used after this is in 1 Samuel 21, 2. 
And it says there, David said to Ahimelech, the priest, the king has charged me with a matter and said to me, let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you and with which I have charged you. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. And really it's for Poloni Almoni place. For such and such a place. It's also used in 2 Kings 6, 8. It says there, once when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with his servants saying, at such and such a place shall be my camp. At Poloni Almoni place shall be my camp. At such and such a place. So this word has been such and such. And when used of a person, it means and so and so. It's almost as if Boaz is saying, hey you, come and sit down here. And the narrator, it's, it's almost like the narrator is tipping us off as this person is just, he's nameless. And you might call him, and I'm going to call him, Mr. So-and-so. Mr. So-and-so is going to come by. Because what's going to happen is that Mr. So-and-so is going to just vanish into oblivion, into irrelevance. Because he's not going to demonstrate the character and the fortitude of Boaz. And so really we don't even need to know his name. He has no legacy. No standing name in the genealogy of David or of Christ. He's just Mr. So-and-so who happens to come by. And so Boaz calls him over to come and sit with him. And look at verse number two. Boaz also took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Now this reveals to us the, the clout and the respect that Boaz had. He comes without any prior announcement, early in the morning, sits by the gate, and as people are coming by, he says, hey, you come over here and sit down. And they obey him. This, this shows the stature of Boaz that these elders of the city who are going out to their field at harvest to work are willing to forego that labor and to sit with Boaz and hear, what does he have to say? And so Boaz's worthiness and his righteousness precedes him. His hard working spirit, his wealth. He's a well-respected man. And so now we have Mr. So-and-so and Boaz and these 10 witnesses who are coming to hear the matter that Boaz needs to settle today. Look at verse number three. Then Boaz said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So here Boaz, Boaz brings up the subject of what he wants to discuss. They all know Naomi has come back. And as Naomi has come back, she has this parcel of land that actually belongs to her late husband, Elimelech, and she is selling this parcel of land. Now, as we read through the, the book of Ruth, we get to this part where like, we never heard about this land before. Why didn't they sell it earlier? Why didn't they use this money from this land to, to care for themselves? And why didn't Ruth come back and, and glean in these fields if they already had land? What is going on here? What is the selling of the land? And what's important for us to understand here is that land in Israel doesn't work like land today. When you sell your land today, you just sell your land to the highest bidder. There's no idea that I need to keep this parcel of property in the family line. But in Old Testament Israel, that's how it worked. The allotments were given to the clans and to the families. Your land was given. And you can't sell your land to somebody else in another clan or another foreigner. That had to be passed down as an inheritance. And selling the land would come when, when you needed funds or income and when you would sell yourself into slavery. And then a family member would come and it would, would buy you out and redeem that that land to redeem you. And so we're not told exactly what has happened to this parcel of land. But not only does Naomi and Ruth need redeeming, but this land needs redeeming. I want to read to you a text from Numbers that talks about this principle of the land staying within the family. In Numbers 27, verse 8 and 10, it says this, if a man dies and has no son, then you shall transfer his inheritance to his daughter. And if he has no daughter, then you shall give his inheritance to his brothers. 
And if he has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to his father's brothers. And if his father has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to the nearest kinsman of his clan, and he shall possess it. And it shall be for the people of Israel a statute and rule as the Lord commanded Moses. And so Naomi is not seeking to have this land go to the highest bidder. She is seeking to see this land come into the hands of the nearest of kin that they might perpetuate the, the, the allotment and the inheritance given to Elimelech and his family. And so again, we're not told what happened to this land. Perhaps it had this lain fallow and unworked these past 10 years and there's nothing good of it and it needed a lot of work to be restored. Perhaps Elimelech wrongly sold it to another person outside of his family and so that land needs to be redeemed and, and those people living on there need to be paid and, and that land ought to be restored back to the family of Elimelech. We're not told, but the land here is involved in this redemption. And so Boaz brings up this matter And then he continues in verse number four. He says, so I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. And if you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not tell me that I may know for there's no one besides you to redeem it and I come after you. And Mr. So-and-so said, I will redeem it. So here Boaz states the matter quite simply. Here's this land that needs to be redeemed, belongs to the family of Elimelech. You are the next closest relation. It is your job to to care for this inheritance and to purchase it and to redeem it. But if you will not, then let me know because I'm next and I'll redeem it. And so Mr. So-and-so says, "I'll, I'll redeem it. In front of these witnesses, in front of Boaz, I will take this land. I will redeem the land. But Boaz is not done. Look at verse five. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. So here Boaz gives another condition, another part of this transaction or this redemption. Not only will Mr. So-and-so have the land, and by that he would understand that he would care for Naomi, but also he is going to have to care for Ruth, the Moabite. She comes with it. And through Ruth is going to come offspring, which will perpetuate the name of Elimelech. That family line will continue. And so as Boaz brings this up. You might be thinking, well, why is he now mentioning this after this man has already agreed to redeem the land? Is is Boaz trying something here tricky to try to get his own way? And I don't think Boaz is trying anything tricky here. He's just laying out the case quite simply. And all that is involved in this land with Naomi, with Ruth. And this man, when he hears that, that Ruth is a Moabite... He he might not know of Ruth's worthiness and her character and her commitment to Naomi and to God, but but he hears that she is a Moabite. So so immediately that would set him a little bit aback. But you notice why Boaz says Ruth is included, even though she is a Moabite. He says... In order to. Look in the middle of verse number five. It says, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to, or so that, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. That is what Boaz is explaining here is not only must you act as a redeemer to rescue Naomi and this land for the family of Elimelech. But you have a responsibility also with Ruth to raise up a godly line as to perpetuate the name of Elimelech. 
So there are other descendants who will then inherit this land. And so Boaz is letting this would-be redeemer know that he'll be a temporary guardian of this land until there are offspring that will be the rightful heir of this land. And what Boaz is saying here is in accordance, again, with the word of God, Boaz being a godly man, he knows this. There's a, a law in scripture that has come to be known as leveret marriage. Lever is from Latin, this meaning a husband's brother, brother-in-law. And it comes from Deuteronomy 25, and I'll read to you verses 5 and 6. It says, if brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the camp to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out in Israel. So Boaz lets this redeemer know that it is incumbent upon you not only to redeem this land, but also to redeem Ruth and that children born from Ruth will be the rightful heir of the name Elimelech and of this land. And this is so that his name would not be blotted out in Israel. That the land would continue its inheritance from generation to generation. Now some when they read this, they're like, well, Boaz is actually misreading that law. Because that law of leveret marriage applies, applies to brothers and brothers living together. There's no indication that this man is a brother or that Boaz is a brother. They're they're just part of the family, but but not brothers. And so Boaz here is not even understanding the law. But I think it's actually modern day commentators don't understand the law when they critique Boaz. Because Boaz and others in that day were not seeking to to obey the letter of the law, to find out what exactly it says so that I can find my way to avoid it or go around it. But they were looking for the principle of that law, the spirit of that law, which then they would be bound to obey. And so yes, it's speaking about brothers who dwell together. But the principle is that the name would not be blotted out from Israel and that other children be born from this union to grow up to receive that inheritance. And so Boaz knows this. And as a man of God, a man who reveres the law of God and the spirit of the law of God, he's not restricting himself to the letter to avoid something he doesn't wish or want. And so he feels it's right not only to redeem this land, but also that Elimelech would have descendants for his name. And so he lets this would-be redeemer, Mr. So-and-so, know this. And look how he answers verse number six. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. So here this man says, I will not take the land. I will not take Ruth. You can have it. I give up my right to redemption because I do not want to impair my own inheritance. And what does he mean by that? He knows that if he is to take that land, well, he might have to pay those who are on there so they get off there so that land is redeemed. At the very least, he is going to have to invest in that land to to plant it and to cultivate it and to work it so that land is profitable. That's going to require effort and work and money on his end to care for that land. Also involved is caring for Naomi. And thus far, he's willing to do this. But then when Ruth is introduced and that Boaz says, and you must marry Ruth and then through Ruth is going to come offspring and descendants who will be the rightful heirs of that land, that it won't be yours, it'll be theirs. Suddenly this man is like, well, then then it's not worth it for me. It's not worth it any longer. You mean I'm going to invest all this effort and money and work into this land and then when those kids grow up, they're going to take it. It won't be mine. I won't be able to profit off of it any longer. And so no thanks. That's going to jeopardize my own inheritance, my own wealth, what I'm going to pass down to to my own children. 
And so I'm giving up my right to be a redeemer. It's too much of a sacrifice. And so Mr. So-and-so demonstrates here the contrast to Boaz. Boaz knows all of this. He is willing to invest in that land. He is willing to care for Naomi. He is willing to care for Ruth, even though she is a Moabite. He's willing to raise up children for the name of Elimelech. He is willing to part with that land when those children are old enough to take it for themselves. He's willing to do all of that, all that self-sacrifice to act as a redeemer. And this Mr. So-and-so simply refuses. I want to pause here in our story and just reflect and then come back out of the ancient world and come back to today and see what important truths we must understand in these first six verses of Ruth chapter four. I think one of the things that's so obvious is that there are many today who live this life like Mr. So-and-so who are in it for themselves. And when the price is too high, when the sacrifice is too great, they're like, no thanks, not for me. You guys go ahead and do that. Knock yourself out. And we do it with things that God says are good and right. There are people today in our world today who do not want to get married. Simply just do not want to get married. They're growing up, I do not want to get married. And some of them I've met, I do not want to get married because I'm too selfish. Because I don't want to give myself for somebody else. There's some people today who do not, do not want to have any children. And why? They, they want marriage. They want a relationship. But I will not have children. Why? Well, in some cases, they do not want to give up what they think is theirs. They do not want to impair their own inheritance. They do not want to spoil their fun or spoil their lives or, or sacrifice for somebody else. They want to live for themselves. So no marriage, no children. Let's not do that. Let's live for me. There are some who are married, may have children, but they don't want their wives. Some husbands don't want their wives to stay home. They want their wives to go out and work. They say they need two incomes. And why? Because if they sacrifice that second income, they also sacrifice a lifestyle that they've come accustomed to. There's some Christians today that speak about the virtue of sending their children to public school and that their children are ministers in the public schools. I think for some, not for all, but for some, the motivation may be because they want that lifestyle without the kids at home with two incomes the lifestyle they've been accustomed to, and it's spoiling their inheritance. There's others who choose to live very private lives. They don't want to get involved in other people's lives. And why is that? Why do we love our privacy? Why do we don't, why do we not want to get involved in other people's lives? Because we don't want the sacrifice. We don't want the time commitment. We don't want the effort and the headache that is involved in getting involved in other people's lives. And so we retreat. We don't want to jeopardize our own inheritance. We want us and me and mine. Self-sacrifice, when your work only benefits another, is not easy. It's not intuitive. It's not common. And it's what we see here in Mr. So-and-so, and it's the opposite of what we see in Boaz. And the point here is not simply, don't be like Mr. So-and-so, be like Boaz. That's not the point, ultimately. The point is, Mr. So-and-so fails to honor God and his word. Boaz lives out the spirit of God's word, the spirit of God's law, and thereby reflects the righteous character of God himself. And as Christians, we seek to be molded and shaped into the image and likeness of God. To be holy, to be sanctified, to do the things that are pleasing to God, which involves self-sacrifice, which involves doing things here like Boaz has done as opposed to Mr. So-and-so. This is what is commanded of us. 
I want to read to you a text from Philippians 2. This is verse 6 to 8. Speaking about our Lord Jesus Christ and him as a redeemer. It says, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. You see what it says there? Jesus in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Hang on to my inheritance. Hang on to what is rightfully mine. No. But rather... He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, which is already a condescension. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's how far down he went to be a redeemer. Giving up the glories of heaven to to come into his own creation, to take on human flesh with all of its weakness, And then becoming a slave and going to the cross and being humiliated and mocked and slaughtered there. Butchered like an animal. So that we could be redeemed. So that we could be forgiven. So that we could be restored to God. Because we were in a hopeless state. Now why does Paul mention that in Philippians 2? the condescension of Christ and his great redemption through his self-sacrifice. Why does he mention it? He tells us why right before that. Listen to what he says. This is the preceding verses. Paul writes, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Who did this? See what Paul is saying there? If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have a mind of Christ in you, if you have been redeemed, if you have been a beneficiary of Christ's amazing grace, if he has condescended from heaven to come down to earth to rescue you through his death, will you not also put the needs of others before your own? Will you not give? Will you not put away your pride and your conceit? Will you not stoop down to care for those in need? Will you not love your neighbor? Will you not love your family? Will you not love your church? Will you not love others who are in need of your help? And if you know nothing of that, if you're like a Mr. So-and-so, the cost is too great, I'm walking away. And the corollary is, then you do not know Christ then you do not understand the redemption to which he has redeemed you by. This is why Paul writes in 1 Timothy 5.8, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. How can that be possible? How can you profess to love a Christ who has come from heaven to redeem you from your sin when you are destined for hell and he gave his life for you and he died for you, took the weight of God's wrath for you and you won't care for your family member? Paul says you're worse than an unbeliever because you ought to care because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. And it goes beyond our family. The Old Testament clan, the large family, applies also to the church. We are here, we are family, we are one another. Galatians 6.10 says this. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. In other words, there is a special obligation for us to care for people in our own household. And to care for people in the household of God, the church. Yes, we are called to do good to everyone. But we must care for our households and we must care for the church. That is first on our priority list. And we're to do so because we have received this incredible grace and mercy and redemption through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And when we've been loved in this manner, then we love others in that same manner. And so you have to ask yourself, does this characterize me? Does this characterize you? Are you like a Mr. So-and-so? Where the Christian life seems good at start. Oh yeah, you mean I get some more property? Some more land? Some more clout? I like that. Oh, there's more to it. Oh, there's sacrifice. Oh, there's self-denial. Oh, there's, there's a loss of an earthly inheritance. On second thought, no thanks. My fear is that's how many approach the Christian life. And the church, many times, is not helping making the Christian life look so, so good, so shiny, so new. Your best life now. And then people realize, this is hard. Jesus calls me to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow him. I don't like that part. And so here, take my inheritance. Take my right of redemption. Take my salvation. Take the forgiveness in Jesus Christ. I don't need that. I'm going to live for myself. I'll be much better on my own. Is that how you navigate life? Is is your Christian faith just a matter of, of marking columns of pros and cons? And as long as there's more pros than cons, you'll you'll persevere and endure to follow Jesus Christ. But as soon as that con list gets a little bit too long, and nobody likes you at work, and you're you're estranged from your family, and you're you're seemed you're a weirdo by the world. Okay, maybe, maybe I'll begin to rethink this. But those like Boaz, those are principally captured by a knowledge of God, an understanding of his love and of his mercy and of his great redemption, are willing to sacrifice, are willing to give up for the sake of God, for the sake of our household, for the sake of our church, for the sake of our neighbor. Don't try to rationalize away your lack of love and sacrifice. Repent. Confess to the Lord. I've been selfish. I've I've been fleeing opportunities to sacrifice and to give. Oh Lord, forgive me. Restore me. Let me see you the way that you truly are so that I might be loving like you're loving. That's why Boaz has a name that is remembered. That's why he has a legacy, a man who follows the Lord. What we see pictured in Christ is here reflected in Boaz and ought to be reflected in those who name the name of Christ as well. Well, let's continue and go back to our story. We're going to jump back in in verse number seven. So we have Boaz laying the thing out before the court, for the elders. We have this man giving up his right of redemption. And we resume with the the minutes of this courtroom meeting in verse number seven. Let me read verse seven through verse 10. It says, now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. The one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilian and Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers And from the gate of his native place, you are witnesses this day. So here's this profession, a wonderful profession from Boaz, making vows before the elders of what he's committing himself to do before God. I will be the redeemer. I will care for Naomi. I will care for this land. I will care for Ruth. I will raise up offspring for the name of Elimelech. I will do it. And then we have this strange custom where this man takes off his sandal and gives it to Boaz. Now, as we consider this custom, I don't want you to feel too bad that this is strange to us. 
Because the fact that it's explained here means it was strange to those who first read the book of Ruth. Now, we know this book of Ruth was written shortly after the time of David because David is mentioned in the book of Ruth at the end. So, so David is known. He's likely already the king, if not just recently passed away. And so as this is recorded, already by that generation, this custom of taking off the sandal was, was not well practiced or well known. And so it was explained here. Now, I want to clarify, it's, it's not necessarily that this practice of exchanging a sandal happened with every single transaction or exchange or purchase, as if they were just passing around sandals all the time instead of currency. But the idea of passing a sandal was explicit and t- tethered to this act of redeeming. We notice that in verse number seven, this was a custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm this transaction of redemption. And so this was necessary or a, an outward sign to all who were observing that not only were words spoken, but deeds and steps taken to seal this transaction. I believe where this custom came from is earlier in the book of Deuteronomy. And I want to read to you Deuteronomy 25, uh, verses 7 to 10. The reason why I'm reading this text, I had already read the first few verses of this about the, the leveret marriage, about a a brother-in-law who's supposed to come in and raise up offspring for his brother to perpetuate his name. Now, if you keep on reading that text, I'm about to read that, the follow-up to that text, which handles what happens if a brother fails to do that. And I want you to listen to what it says there. Deuteronomy 25, starting in verse 7, it says, if the man or the brother does not wish to take his brother's wife Then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate to the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him. And if he persists, okay, no repentance. If he persists saying, I do not wish to take her, then his brother's wife shall go up to him in the presence of the elders pull off his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. And she shall answer and say, so shall it be done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. And the name of his house shall be called in Israel. Here's the name. The house of him who had his sandal pulled off. So as God gives this stipulation, this this act of shame to this man who refuses to fulfill his obligation and to perpetuate the name of his brother. That this humiliating act, taking off his sandal, this wife spitting in his face, is to to make this act so repulsive that people would not actually do this. And so this act of this man taking off his sandal, he's not inviting Boaz necessarily to spit in his face, but to show that that I am that man who's, who's giving up this act of redemption. And it's, it's yours. I, I say, no, I refuse to do it. And so this man does not fulfill his obligations. He gives up his sandal to Boaz and Boaz acts as the redeemer. Now let's continue. Look at verse 11 and 12. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So here we have witnesses there at the gate. We also have those elders who see this transaction in word and in deed and thereby now pronounce a blessing, a ruling upon Ruth and upon Boaz. And we'll look at these blessings of the elders. The first blessing is in verse number 11. When the elders speak to their fact, speak to the fact that they are witnesses and then say, may the Lord make the woman, Ruth, who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. So here is the, the blessing that they wish 
the Lord to provide and the Lord to work in and through Ruth that through her, Boaz's house might be built up. Now, building up the house, as we've already read in Deuteronomy, has to do with, God, with offspring, godly offspring, who are going to build up that household. This this view of, of a, the next generation to carry on the name, to be faithful before the Lord. This is what it means to have the house built up, to have it full of children, and have them nurtured to obey God. Now, he already saw that Mr. So-and-so refused. And so a sandal was taken off, just like it was done to the man, it says in Deuteronomy 25, who does not build up his brother's house. And so the elders asked God for a blessing upon Ruth that through her, the house may be built, that she might have children, essentially. And that she might be fruitful like Rachel and Leah, that from them and from their Servants come the 12 sons of Israel, the head of the 12 tribes. Now at this point, it's interesting to note that Ruth is childless. She's been married before, did not have a child. And so perhaps she is barren. Perhaps the Lord had closed her womb. I think the Lord had closed her womb. And now they're asking the Lord to open her womb and to give her blessings and to give her children second blessing that the elders give is upon Boaz. And so after asking that through Ruth, the house may be built up, they say at the, near the end of verse number 11, speaking to Boaz, may you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem and may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So this blessing pronounced upon Boaz is that he might act worthily, be renowned, be known for his strength, his fortitude, his righteousness, his hard work, his virtue in Bethlehem. And that also his house will be built up just like the house of Perez. Now, when he mentions Perez and Tamar and Judah, it's important to understand what these elders are talking about. That brings us back to Genesis 38. We have Tamar who's married to one of Judah's sons, Ur. Now, God has already killed off one of Judah's sons for his wickedness. And Tamar is married to Ur. And because of his wickedness, God kills him off. So now Tamar is left without husband and left without a son. And Judah has another son, Onan. And Onan refuses to do the leveret marriage and to come in to Tamar and to raise up offspring for Ur. And Onan is even more, he's even worse than just simply refusing. But Onan on multiple occasions goes in and sleeps with Tamar, but then wastes his seed on the ground so that she would not get pregnant. And so the Lord killed Onan for his wickedness leaving Tamar without child, without husband, and with only a much younger brother who was not of the age of marriage. So she was forgotten by Judah. And as she gets older, and as Judah's other son gets older, Judah forgets about Tamar. And so Tamar decides to take things into her own hands, dresses herself as a prostitute. Judah ends up sleeping with her. And then from that union comes twins, Perez being one of them. Now, Judah recognizes his sin in that. Tamar is not commended for what she did. But yet you can see her desperation in being a mother and having children. But of her twins, one of them, Perez, would be a significant figure in the household of Judah. And is the ancestor of Boaz, the ancestor of David, the ancestor of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so these elders are recognizing that with Judah and with Tamar, with Perez, like that was some messed up stuff. But from that, God was faithful to build the house of Judah and the house of Perez and to use all of their sin. And God gave grace to build a line for himself. And so Ruth, a Moabite, 
these other two husbands are killed off. Elimelech is dead. You know, this is, this is a mess. But may God use you, Boaz, and use you, Ruth, to perpetuate and to build a household for the name of God. And so the elders aren't drawing a direct comparison with Tamar and with Ruth. Wholly different. But yet, how the Lord blessed their children is what is the focus here. Now I want to consider this blessing. We're actually going to end at verse 12 today. I'm going to pick up verse 13 next week. But I want to consider this blessing of the elders. And I want you to think about, again, as we, as we come back from the ancient world and come back to today's world, how foreign this blessing sounds to us today. Can you imagine a, a marriage ceremony today where there's a pronouncement upon the bride of may you be fruitful and build this house and, and make a name for this household and this clan? And for the husband, may you be renowned. May your name be, be seen as, as worthy. May you act worthily and may you build a house and may with that household bring honor and glory to the fame of God. Most pronouncements of blessing or most well wishes today have to do not with building a house, but have to do with a wish of happiness. Then people get married today. It's like, oh, I, I hope that he makes you happy. And I hope that she makes you happy. And, and I hope that you're happy together. It's not about, even today in Christian circles, to, to even make a prayer at a wedding tape talking about coming children. It's like, ooh, how do you know they're going to have children? Maybe, maybe, maybe they're going to choose not to. They, they want to be happy together. And so whatever makes them happy. So that is the, that is the blessing that is typically given today. May you be happy. May you have joy. May you, may you do what makes you happy. But here we see in the Old Testament and here in Ruth in, in accordance with God's law and character is may a house be built. May the next generation be faithful because of you. May you produce offspring that are going to honor the Lord and perpetuate a name that will be known, a name that is worthy, a name that is renowned. Not so much may you be happy here and now in your little life. May, may you leave a legacy. May you build a household. May there be multiple generations of faithfulness that they can look back and say, well, granddad, he was a worthy man. He knew the Lord. And he didn't live for his own happiness or temporal joy. He lived to build a legacy and a line and a household. He was blessed. And great grandma, she had godly children that she loved and nurtured and cared for. I don't even know her name. She's his grandma. But she left a legacy of godly children seeking to serve the Lord. Because in our day and age, we always think about the temporal, the here and the now, and our own happiness. Because we're more concerned about our kingdom than Christ's kingdom. We're more concerned about just the here and now in this generation rather than the next generation and the generation after that. And to see a long line of faithfulness bringing honor and glory to Jesus Christ. Now this blessing given to Boaz came true. He is renowned. His name is recorded for all of eternity. He's in Matthew's genealogy. When you read Matthew chapter one, Boaz is right there. And Mr. So-and-so is irrelevant and absent. God used a man like Boaz to bring forth David, then to bring forth the Christ. To be a redeemer to Naomi and to Ruth, and even a part in the redemption of coming generations. Maybe said of us, that's my desire. Sometimes our goals are just too small. Our, our happiness this week is too small. What, what about the joy of living a worthy life before Christ? To building a house, 
to making disciples, to be part of what God is doing in the world. Now, not everyone here is going to be part of a household or, or married or in the midst, in the throes of parenting. But your life is still part of what God is doing in the world. So are you going to live your life in a worthy manner to bring blessing and honor and glory to God? More supremely than your own happiness. Knowing that for a true believer, you will get happiness as you give glory to God. But how will you live in your job, in your marriage, with your children, with your relationships? How are you going to live in those spheres And not just for you and for your own happiness, but how are you going to live to perpetuate the glory of God and the honor of his name? How are you going to be part of God's story throughout history from generation to generation as we see his redeeming work unfolding? How are you going to advance the kingdom of God, which is an eternal kingdom and not a temporary one, which is here today and gone tomorrow? How are you going to labor for the church to see the house of the Lord here built up? Are we going to have this desire for one another like the elders have for Boaz and for Ruth? As I was meditating on this passage, I thought to myself, is it passe? Is it this old-fashioned? Have we, have we moved past this in the new covenant age? to wish of our wives to be fruitful and multiply and to have children that grow up to honor and follow the Lord? Is that somehow not holy or godly or something we should desire? And what about husbands to be renowned for their worthiness, their excellence, their virtue? Or is it that perhaps our goals are not aligned with Scripture and that our happily ever after doesn't look like what the Scripture says. Back to the question I first asked when we began. Who is the Redeemer? We see here it's not Mr. So-and-so. It's Boaz. But more than Boaz, it's God who is orchestrating his redemption. Bringing in this web of all these relationships and people to bring about his kingdom, his plans and his purposes through David and then through Christ. And so Boaz knows that God is the Redeemer and so trusted Him. And the question for us is, do we trust God as our Redeemer? Do we trust God that that we can be part of His plan going from generation to generation and commit our lives to, to live for Him here and now? Are we bitter like Naomi rather than trusting and waiting upon the Lord? How will you live Will you calculate what seems best to you like Mr. So-and-so or will you trust the Lord and see his love and then self-sacrifice? If we've experienced God's love and grace through Jesus Christ, if we've experienced the forgiveness of our sin, if we have the hope of eternal life, if we have the promise of entry into his eternal kingdom to have new bodies free from sickness and death where God will wipe away our sorrows and comfort our tears, if that is our hope, then we will live in this life, a life of sacrifice, of loyalty, of service. We will leave an aroma of Jesus Christ as we labor to see his salvation wrought in and through us. That's what the story of Boaz and Ruth exemplify for us. Two people seeking to do what's right and honorable before God and then God using them mightily. We do not know how God would use you, or I don't know how God would use you or me. But our task is to be honorable and righteous, to trust the Lord Jesus Christ, to commit ourselves to him, and to live a life seeking to please our heavenly father and to live for his kingdom, and then trust that he will use that life to advance his cause in this world from generation to generation. Let's pray.